What's going on, everybody? Today we'll be doing chapter 5 of Apple Fugard's Tsotsi. In the time that Tsotsi had sat in the ruins, two unimportant and unnoticed events took place in the township. Gambut de Halmini was buried and Boston awoke. The cemetery was an accrege of crowded, sandy oil. There was a fence around the perimeter, but termites had got into the poles and eaten them away at the base. Most of them now hung free of the ground, and a few had fallen over, dragging the wires down with them. The cemetery was rarely an accident. The people had had to bury their dead, and when the authorities came around to discussing the matter, the cemetery already existed. It was then hurriedly made official, because with that strange reverence that authority has for dead bodies, they sent in a team of workmen to erect the fence and to plant the trees at regular intervals along its length. The trees were a failure. They were meant to be cypresses, but someone had made a mistake at the nursery. At least three quarters had died, and the survivors had grown up deformed and twisted out of all resemblance to what was intended. They were a type of pine with a deep, almost black-green foliage. If you took your sorrow to their shade, you got covered all over by sticky, resinous secretion on the tanks and branches. Gumboot had been allocated a plot near the centre. He was buried by the Reverend Henry Ransom of the Church of Christ, the Redeemer in the township. The minister went through the ritual with uncertainty. He was disturbed, and he knew it, and that made it worse. If only he had known the name of the man he was burying. This man, O oh Lord, what man? This one. This one right here, fashioned in your likeness. What does it matter what his name was? This one, this man. He had seen the face briefly when the police called him in. It was the hate, the hideous distorted hate of its grimace, and he remembered now. This one, O oh Lord, this man fashioned in your image. The other person at the graveside was Big Jacob, the digger. He had taken off his hat with respect and was resting on the spade. While the minister prayed, Big Jacob studied his head. It was the hair that fascinated him, very white and wispy, something like the seeds of a certain weed that drifted away under umbrellas of a thin, silken thread. A wind was blowing now, ruffling the stock of hair, and he thought that if he waited long enough, he might see it fly off. The, Ren the Reverend Henry Ransom crossed himself and looked up at the sky with a frown. Big Jacob looked down and played with the brow of his hat. Who is he? he asked. The minister looked at him once, very quickly, then back at the sky. He lifted his shoulders in a gesture of defeat. I don't know, he said. Big Jacob scratched his head before putting his hat back on. Friday night, he said. We'll say we buried Friday night on Saturday afternoon. Big Jacob began to push the soil into the grave. It wasn't necessary to shovel. It was all sand. The minister turned and walked back to his church. He was, so he was sorely troubled. Boston awoke, and the first thing he saw was the little boy, standing quite still, watching him over the bicycle wheel rim he was using as a hoop. To be exact, it wasn't the first time he had opened his eyes since the and butcher had carried him out of Sookie's and dumped him where he now found himself, in a back alley. Once in the early morning, and again at noon, his eyelids had fluttered and opened, and he had tried to get up, 
but pain had moved along every nerve in his body, and he had dropped back the few inches of his effort, unconscious. Now he tried again. His head spun. A red mist drifted before his eyes, and he whimpered, but he managed to sit up. The child watched him, expressionless but intent. Boston looked down stupidly at his legs. Something was wrong. It took a few minutes before he realized what it was. Somebody had stolen his trousers, his good grey flannels, most probably while he was unconscious. A badly torn khaki pair lay out not far from him. The child was still watching, his, his chin now resting on the hoop. Boston opened his mouth but found he couldn't make intellectual sound. He gestured at the trousers, but the little boy ran away with a furious flurry of his short legs, playing his hoop in front of him with a short stick. There was nothing for Boston to do but crawl across the tr to the trousers. It took a long time, and when he reached them he was crying. Every move had brought its own individual wave of pain. He rested and then began even the even more difficult, more excruciating job of getting the trousers on. The little boy came back with his hoop while he was busy, standing a safe distance away to watch him with the same expressionless intensity. Boston staggered down the alleyway. Where am I going? he asked himself once. It doesn't matter, he thought. Nothing matters now, not a single thing. He had seen his body and felt his face. He had remembered Tsotsi. There's nothing left. It's all finished now, at last. Every single bloody thing is finished. He felt like saying goodbye to the earth and to the sky and to the sun. If there had been a tree nearby, he would have shaken its hand. He was convinced it was all utterly finished. He won't come, Butcher said, bending forward to pick up a few stones, which he started throwing at a lamppost. He will, said the Ark. They were lounging about on the pavement outside Tsotsi's room. Anyway, I don't care, Butcher added. Same here, said the Ark. This had been going on for a long time. The trouble was neither of them knew what to think about the fight at Suki's last night. Whether or not Tsotsi had included them in his attack on Boston, he had been dis they had been discussing the matter ever since. Did it mean, for example, that the gang was finished, or just Boston? He certainly was. He was more finished than anything they had ever seen. He was so finished, in fact, he was almost dead. Suki hadn't been able to help. I heard nothing, I tell you, just all of a sudden like Boston cries. What was Tootsie doing? Kicking him. What's he say? Who? Tootsie? Nothing. And Boston? He was crying, man, like I tell you. They hadn't worried much about it then, because the day was finished. The job done. They had drunk a lot and taken a woman. Soon they would sleep. It emerged as a real problem the next day when they awoke. Time always posed the same question. What can I do with it? Your only escape from this predicament lay in a gang because that had a leader and he decided what to do. For a long time they had been following Tsotsi in this way. The prospect of getting through a whole day without him was unsettling. They discussed the matter, sitting in the morning sun. So what you say? asked Butcher. He didn't say nothing to us, said the Arp. So? So I don't know, said the Arp. He was finished all right. Who? Boston man. Truly. So do you think he wants us? Butcher waited. Speak, man. I don't know, said the Arp unhappily. I tell you, 
I don't know, man. They drifted in their style through the day, through the streets, stopping for a drink, there for dice, somewhere else for something to eat, pulled on by gravity of habit and dependence so that around the middle of the afternoon, almost you might say by accident, since they were so free of a conscious purpose, they found themselves outside Tsotsi's room. They waited a long time, lounging around in the pavement. He won't come, Butcher had said. He will. Anyway, I don't care. Same here. Butcher was throwing his stones at the lamppost. About every fourth found its mark with a dull, metallic note. If he doesn't come, I'll just go. Clung as a stone hit the lamppost. I got places and people. I can go right now. Clung, clung. The arp had joined him in throwing stones at the lamppost. And you? The butcher asked. Same here, said the arp. Clung. Butcher dusted off his hands. He had had enough of throwing stones. He thinks he's good, but I can go. Clung. The arp was still throwing. Come, let's go, said Butcher. Okay. The arp paused while he threw another stone. Clung. Butcher had his cap so low over his eyes that when the arp nudged him, he had to tilt back his head to see Tortsy, who had turned into the street a little way up and was walking towards them. They were both glad, because one way or another, the matter would be settled. Tootsie went into the room without saying a word to them. He ignored them quite simply because he himself did not know what he wanted. Butcher and the Arp were in a strange way remote from his new realities. It was difficult to think about them, to, to decide purposefully if he wanted them or not. So what was he going to do? There they stood waiting for a word or a cook's. Something was sure to happen, and that would start something else, and one way or another the problem would resolve itself. So Butcher and the Arp stood outside, looking at each other, and Tsotsi sat down in his bed in his room. What happened was this. A young and comely woman, carrying her baby in a blanket on her back, walked past in the street. The baby cried, and, but and Butcher looked up and saw her. Feed him, sister, he called. Come feed him here beside me. The woman, seeing him, and the light in his eyes, spat into the dust and went her way. Tootsie appeared at the door. He had heard Butcher's words and the baby. Encouraged by Tootsie's interest, Butcher stepped away from the wall and called out to the back of the woman. If you got no milk, sister, let him suck me. He turned to Tsotsi and smiled and said, Nyama, which means meat. Tsotsi was looking at this woman. There was a thought there, a big thought. Butcher pulled his hat even lower over his eyes and walked up to Tsotsi. Shall we find one in play? he asked. Tsotsi just shook his head. Later, he said, and he was re referring to the big thought Butcher's words had put into his mind. But by then, the ice was broken. He had made contact with them again, so he said, Come, and turned back inside. Butcher and the Arp followed him happily. When they had settled down at the table and Butcher screwed up his nose and looked around the room. Jesus, what smells in here? he asked. Tsotsi said nothing, but went to a corner and rolled up the reeking, swaddling clothes and threw them into the backyard where almost immediately a host of flies descended on them. And later a small and hungry dog dragged them away to a corner. 
They missed Boston that afternoon. They missed his lot of words. Butcher tried his best, but told each of his four stories in a few words. Once I took a man on the trains and he had a hundred pounds. What else was there to say on, the ma on that matter? A hundred pounds. Or the time of his escape. We killed him in the Quella van. We jumped on him. Boston would have gone on forever with a sentence like that. The four of us did jump on him and kick him. When these two were told, there was left only the time he had worked with Morgan Blackjack Magotso and the white woman whom he caught alone in the house. When those were also told, there was nothing left. They sat in silence, and for a long time, the only sound was the strange sucking noises the op made when he put his big lips to a beer bowl. Sotsi surprised them both with this question. Where's Boston? The Arp blinked, and Boston opened his mouth, but nothing came out. It wasn't the thought of Boston that surprised. He had been constantly but unvoiced in both their minds that afternoon. What surprised them was Sotsi asking, he was looking at Butcher, waiting for him to speak. I don't know, Boston said. Tsotsi closed his eyes and then looked into the street. Butcher fidgeted in his seat. He felt the capital should be made of the mention of Boston to keep the words flowing. But how? Maybe at Suki's place, he said. And then later, we left him there, at the back. He struggled once more with the silence. He's bad. R ragtig bad, hey? And he looked at the arp, who took his lips away from the bottle, said bad, and then an another drink. Then Butcher gave up. The few sparks of interest and word about Boston died away. Tsotsi closed the subject by ignoring it as abruptly as he had opened it. And that only because he was thinking about condensed milk, he had decided to forget about it when he left the room. I have fed it. I have hidden it safe. I will come back tomorrow, he had said to himself. In the meantime, I will carry on as always. It hadn't worked that way. The thought about the shoebox and its contents, the enigma of his memory of the bitch, though these slipped back repeatedly into his consciousness, no matter how determinedly he had thrown them out a few minutes before. The simplest things started the sequence. Butcher had teased a woman, and before Tootsie knew what was happening, he stood at the door thinking about that baby. A little later, Butcher had smelt the rags, and back it was again. The baby, the shoebox, the blue gums, the bitch. Over and over again, sometimes the cycle extending itself to include another detail like condensed milk, which is why he had asked about Botts. Added to this was another problem, which was much more elusive than Tootsie's struggle. It started off quite simply as his awareness of Butcher and the Ark. They were there. He had wondered if they would come, and they had. He himself had taken them in, taken them back, so to speak. Why then did he find himself looking at them at odd moments with something like irritation and impatience? Theirs was a ponderous presence in a subtle, ill-defined way, was intrusive, almost an encumbrance. He had never been conscious of men like this before. 
In fact, it had only rarely happened that he had been conscious of them at all, as the people with whom he lived and had to lead. Boston had been an exception. Boston, through definite actions, had made Sotsi aware of him. The same thing had happened now to Butcher and the Ark, yet they had done nothing. Out of this vague drift of feeling and thought, the two men at the table alternating with the baby in the box and the bitch under the bluegum trees, emerged another problem. But this was defined and decisive as the others were nebulous and vague. It was nearing the time when it was expected of him to announce the plan of action for the night, and he had nothing to say. How had it worked the other times? Boston would be talking, and they would be drinking and listening, only half listening. Adrift on the flow and sound of words, their eyes half closed except for gro except when groping for another bottle under the table, or reflecting on the length of the shadows in the street, and by their length measuring the time between that moment in darkness. Boston telling his long, long story until somehow, something, some small thing like a thought, or a shadow, or a feeling, or even a word, some small thing like that would precipitate in his inward darkness a desire, minute and murderous. That was the beginning, because with time it grew and became the purpose he finally spoke that led them out of the room and into the night. That was how it happened, but now it was different, and not happening at all. And it wasn't just because Boston wasn't there. What was expected of him, what the other two were waiting for, was a decision, and this was something else that Tsotsi had never been aware of before. It involved choice. Was it to be the trains again, or a taxi driver? or a darkened, deserted house in one of the white suburbs. These, and their variations, were his repertoire. And they, the arp moody, and butcher twitching with impatience now, were waiting for him to choose. It was the awareness of alternatives that disturbed Tsotsi, and seemed to paralyze his will. Up to that moment, he had lived his life as the victim of dark impulses. They had been ready, rising to his moments of need all through his life. Where they came from, he never knew, and their reasons for coming, he had never questioned. What he realised now was that something had tampered with the mechanism that had governed his life, inhibiting its function. Tootsie slammed a clenched fist into the palm of the other hand, and the other two, thinking he had decided, looked at him expectantly. He stood up and walked on stiff, nervous legs to the door. What do we do, Tsotsi? Butcher asked. Speak, man. He closed his eyes and grabbed his fist, thought. We go to the city, he said. This was hardly an answer because the city was big and going there could mean a taxi job, or prowling around for a dark house, or a drunk near one of the shabines around the mine dumps. It was vague and innovation, but thought he thought didn't care because the others reacting to the purpose it suddenly gave to life had stood up and were following him into the street. Butcher looked back once at the room. Did you smell, man? He asked the There's something smelling in there. Stinking like shit.